have a hard time when I turn on the radio listening to various TV or radio preachers. They have a variety of different points of view. Quite often I come to disagree with multiple things that I hear. I can imagine that for those who might travel from one church to the next and hear different preachers and look at different churches, they might say, similarly, what is this battle of confusion? In one church you have one thing said, a second church something else, and the third down the road says something entirely different. Catholics say you have to honor Mary and observe the Mass. You need to do penance and and there's a place called purgatory, and they have a whole lineup of things you need to believe. The Lutherans reject all that, and they present a different point of view. The mainline Protestants will uh, talk about um, Jesus as an example for us, and we should live a life of love, and that is how we should lead our lives. This notion of a bloody atonement and of the law of God that's all negative and, and that, that's uh, barbaric. We are well beyond that. We are enlightened. We are positive. We have a, a hopeful message for people today. A message of love. And who doesn't want that? And then you, you might go to the charismatic church and find a very excited congregation and a very enthusiastic preacher. And they might have all kinds of things to say, saying that you need to be filled with the Spirit and you need to speak in tongues. And only by this empowering of the Spirit will you uh, be effective in your Christian life. Wonder, well, where's the truth? And then you come into an Orthodox Presbyterian church and say, we're all wrong. <laughs> but hopefully, if you come to that Orthodox Presbyterian church, you'll not simply hear that, but you'll hear why they are wrong from the scriptures and what exactly is right from the scriptures. You see, God warns us in advance that there will be all kinds of, if you will, false prophets and all kinds of people who go out into the world misleading the people of God, teaching all kinds of things, their own visions and dreams of what they think should be said, how we think we should live. And they'll quote the psychologists and they'll quote the philosophers to add some weight to what they have to say. They will uh, quote some of the great religious leaders of the past, go back to Mahatma Gandhi and all the rest of them, uh, Mother Teresa and and bring all these many people together and craft a message that has nothing whatsoever to do with God's Word. The prophet Jeremiah was no stranger to this experience. He was a minority prophet. I don't mean that in terms of his race, but in terms of his ministry, his faithfulness to the Word of God. He ministered the Word of God in a culture which was rife with false prophecy. All kinds of things were going through the nation. Whether it be those who were presenting themselves as the Lord's prophets, the prophets of Yahweh, or those who were prophets of the various religions all around them, or some amalgamation of the two. Jeremiah had quite a challenge before him. All of the respected prophets all those who were credentialed and accepted within the, the uh, royal ranks were opposed to what he had to say. And eventually, as it becomes clear, they, they showed their opposition to Jeremiah by even wanting to put him to death. Such was their hatred for what he had to say. Jeremiah spoke in a religiously pluralistic age where there are all kinds of points of view but generally, they tended to coalesce around what the leadership wanted. This was not unique in Jewish history. You can go back a hundred, couple hundred years prior to this to Israel in the north. In the days of King Ahab and Jezebel, you remember them, the conflicts they had with Elijah the prophet. One day, the, the, the southern king, Jehoshaphat, went up to Ahab and he wanted to join Ahab in a battle scene. And Ahab, or Jehoshaphat asked Ahab before they go out to battle to consult the prophets, to consult the word of the Lord and see what God would say about whether we should go into battle or not. So Ahab had his court prophets. He gathered them all around him and he asked them, shall we go out into battle? And they all uniformly said, yes, go out into battle. You will be prosperous in this. And even one of the prophets, Serves me. It was Zedekiah, 
put horns on his head and you know, very dramatically said, by these horns you will thrust and strike your enemies and drive them away. That man was charismatic. He was dramatic. Now Jehoshaphat was from the southern kingdom, from Judea. He had the temple there in Jerusalem. And he was a little bit suspicious of the religious uh, centers there up in the north. So he said to Ahab, well, don't you have a prophet of the Lord? One who, somebody else. You remember what Ahab said, you can check it out in 1 Kings 22, 7 Chronicles 18. Ahab says to him, well, there's this small prophet. And he, he doesn't like me. And everything he says against me is wrong. His name is Micaiah, the son of Nibla. And Jehoshaphat, well, let's see what he has to say. And, and they have calls him into the court. And interestingly, when he comes into the court, what happens? The courtiers, the, the, the emissaries of the court, come up to Micaiah before he arrives and gives him a certain little bit of advice. Here's the political uh, winds that are blowing here, Micaiah. This is what you need to say. So he was, they were preparing him, trying to help him out, help, help him come to a message that would be pleasing to the king. He advanced his own uh, situation in, in the kingdom here. So they tried to help him out. What does Micaiah do when he comes into this great court? And in a, the tone of sarcasm, he says, Oh, yes, King Ahab, go out into battle. And you shall have victory upon victory, and your enemies will fall at your feet. They had what he was doing. And so he pressed them. Micaiah, what has God really said? And then he goes home and says, I saw the armies of Israel fallen, and the king. Now, who's the judge? Which one is right? Was it Micaiah with his lone, uh, strange, esoteric message? Or was it the court prophets, those who were accepted? You know, I'm reminded of our current political position where if you look at the, the American press, they seem to be the echo chamber of the political leadership, what the political leadership wants. Well, there's a other party, the press kind of touts along the way not much serious criticism or evaluation. And that's kind of what you had with the court of prophets back in uh, Micaiah's day and Jeremiah's day. They touted the party line. It was the best way to advance in, in their careers. But who really was right? How do you discern between the two? Micaiah's experience gives us some insight into that. He talks about standing in the counsel of the Lord and seeing the Lord upon his throne with uh, his servants in his heavenly court to one side and to the other side. And the Lord, in what, what, what one commentator described as a battle council, the Lord asked his courtiers in the divine palace, who shall lead the heavens? Said this one says, another finally spirit steps up and says, I will be a seen spirit in the mouths of the prophets. And lead them. Lead they have to his destruction. And God said, Go. God's judgment was on Ahab, and it was right. The time had come for judgment to arrive. And God would even use the evil elements of the world to accomplish his righteous purpose bringing justice to Ahab and punishing him. But the distinctive thing here is that Micaiah stood in the counsel of the Lord and he heard the word of God. By contrast, these prophets in Ahab's court were trading their own opinions. They were speaking of their own mind, of their own dreams. Here's the great difference. A word from God Himself, or a word that rises from the human heart. Even when the human heart is deceived as to its true origins, they might think it's from God, but actually there's a demonic spirit at work in them. 
so the true prophet of God was one who stood in the council of God. You see this from time to time. Isaiah in his sixth chapter has this vision of God high and lifted up, seated upon his throne. The cherubim crying out, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And God commissions Isaiah to be a prophet by sending a serve the coal from the altar to purge his lips, thereby not converting him, but purging him of his sins and equipping him for his prophetic ministry. He bore a revelation from God. A lot of people today question whether there can be a revelation from God. And they reject that notion. They see everything as composed in this realm, this world order. We have to come to our own opinions about what we believe and what, how we should live. The scriptures proclaim that there's a God who is above this creation who is able to reveal himself perfectly and completely through his prophets. Isaiah was one like that, and Jeremiah as well. At the very beginning of the first chapter, you see him be called and commissioned to his service as a prophet of the Lord. Who stands in the counsel of the Lord? Who has heard truly the word of God, and who is merely presenting the word of man? Jeremiah evaluates these prophets who were there in the courts of this day and shows that what they spoke was a vision of their own minds, something that from their own hearts. It was their best ideas to how one should live. And so, if you will, a rather humanistic religion, the religion of, the, of humanity, was the burden of what they had to say. Interestingly, an oracle from God is described as a burden. And some of these men proclaimed their oracles from God. It was a burden from God. Jeremiah says, you people are becoming a burden to me because of their falsehoods, their lies. They spoke, but they were not commissioned by God. They did not have authority for what they had to say. There needs to be divine authority for that message. We can go on to observe that Jeremiah not only spoke of the essential nature of God's counsel and how the prophet must speak with the authority of God, a message directly from God. The second, Jeremiah compares the word of God, that which is spoken, to the, the messages of the prophets, these dreams and visions of their own hearts and minds, these things which they borrow from one another. And incidentally, these things which they use to cause God's people to forget the true God. Never forget, there's not a kind of a, a religious neutrality here. There is a hostile intent to the message of these false prophets. The intent is to uh, remove a knowledge of the true God and to substitute another God. So when you go to modernistic preaching, uh, or perhaps even the emergent church preaching, which departs from the Word of God and, and celebrates the human spirit and these kinds of things, recognize that it is hostile to the truths of God's word. And it intends to diminish, weaken, and even cause us to forget the true God. If your mind is focused over here in a humanistic religion, you will not be thinking about God and his word. So Jeremiah points his people to the character of God's word. And look at what he has to say. It's a word which comes, that, that can be distinguished between straw and wheat. It comes as fire and as a hammer that breaks the rocks. Dramatic images. At one of my commencement services at Westminster Seminary, uh, president at that time, Dr. Edmund Clowney, gave a commencement address on this very text, urging the graduates to speak the word of God and not to speak the words of men. And he spoke of how God's word is like wheat as compared to straw or chaff. The chaff provides no nourishment. There's no help there. 
It feeds people, but it doesn't nourish them. The wheat is that which nourishes the children of God. And so the ministry of the Word will be effective in building up the people of God, building up their faith, their understanding of God and His ways. And so we should run for the true Word of God so that our souls might be nourished. The Word of God is like fire. It purges the hearts and minds of God's people, sanctifies them, cleanses them of their evil ways, and purifies them for service to the Lord so that they would be filled with the Spirit and empowered to serve God. At the same time, for the wicked, that Word of God is a fire which burns and destroys, eventually not only convicting the heart and making them uncomfortable in the presence of God and His Word, but also reminding them of the judgment to come, the fires of hell. Note in that light, what Jeremiah says here about the presence of God filling earth and heaven. People think that they can hide from God and escape His judgment. They think that God doesn't care, or God is remote, He's far up there. God says, Am I not a God who's near? God is everywhere present. He sees everything that takes place. And so His Word, like fire, pierces and purges the human heart. Finally, for those who are unrepentant, for those who are hardened and steadfast in their opposition to God, the Word of God is like a hammer that breaks the rocks, not in a favorable way. It crushes the opposition. You see how Jeremiah's preaching was contrary to the message of the day. A message of hope and optimism, saying that everything is well with you. You will have peace. All will go just fine. Don't listen to that reactionary, mean-spirited, negative prophet. Have a hopeful message. It was a negative message. 
He called the, the Pharisees of his day the children of the devil. But there was hope if they trusted in Jesus and in his message. Jesus is the one who's greater than Moses. He is the great prophet of the church who speaks the word of God to us today. The writer to the Hebrew says in the second chapter, about verse 3, that how shall we escape if we neglect so great a, a salvation? If there was no mercy to those that listened to the one who warned from earth, how shall we escape from the one who warns us from heaven? Christ is the true prophet who has ascended into heaven above and he speaks his word to us today. The message that is wheat, fire, and